Thank you all for uh, waking up so early this morning to come to our uh, session on algorithmic testing. It's always very satisfying and a pleasure to, to see such a full room. So thank you. And thank you for coming back after your break. <laughs> so um, what we'll do next in this session is uh, complete the session talking about our algorithms. And I think there have been several questions about uh, our algorithms, and they are all on your conference app. So you certainly don't need to take photographs. The, the algorithms are all on the conference app. And there's limited time for questions because we have to stay on time, so we apologize for that. But the speakers will be available after the uh, session at 11 for any of those that have, uh, continue to have questions. So um, I'll proceed with my uh, section, um, and I'll be talking about algorithmic thrombophilia testing. I like to know my audience. So by show of hands, how many of you are laboratory professionals? Okay. Clinicians, pure clinicians? Okay, good. I think I, I, th that helps me to know what areas to emphasize on during my talk. So I don't have any relevant disclosures except one very important one that affects everybody. Did I change my slide set? You betcha. Of course I did. And so the slide set on the conference app will be updated and you will have the updated version. There are minor changes with a few extra slides, so you won't miss much. In the next uh, 25 or so minutes, I'll be uh, explaining the concept of thrombophilia. Uh, hopefully the audience at the end of that will recognize the congenital and acquired thrombophilias state the practical application of management of patient management uh, um, with thrombophilia testing, but more importantly to understand the limitations of the uh, current assays and realize the value of algorithmic approach. So what's a thrombophilia? Thrombophilia is not really a disease. It's, it's really a um, risk factor for venous thrombosis. So thrombophilias may be con congenital, uh, may be acquired, and they may interact with each other, putting the patient at risk for thrombosis. So eventually a patient may or may not develop thrombosis, but multiple interactions may lead to thrombosis. This slide essentially shows you the list of hereditary and acquired thrombophilias, and you can see the um, activated protein C resistance and factor V Leiden mutation uh, are the most common hereditary risk factors in the white population, followed by prothrombin gene mutation and then selected dysfibrinogenemias, and then of course everybody recognizes the um, antithrombin protein C and protein S deficiency states. On the, uh, on the right side uh, of your screen are the uh, list of the acquired thrombophilias, and Dr. Nichols just covered the uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome group of patients, but far more common are the clinical risk factors that are acquired risk factors for thrombophilia. They're numerous. And this next slide uh, just shows you what they are. Essentially, patients undergoing surgery, having trauma, being hospitalized for any reason, cancer with or without chemotherapy, pregnancy. So there's a whole list of acquired thrombophilias that influence uh, initial and recurrent events. So in the big picture, you have to put the two together. You have to kind of look at the patient, assess the acquired risk factors, and then as I'll talk about it, decide whether you're going to extend uh, anticoagulation or not. So an algorithmic approach to thrombophilia testing involves not, is not just an algorithm in the laboratory. It starts off with patient selection. Who do you test? That's a very common question I get asked. And, you know, my diplomatic response usually is in medicine there are, there's always yeses and there are always noes, and, but there's a heck of a lot of maybes. So maybe you'll be testing patients, maybe you won't, and I'll try to illustrate that. And then, of course, we'll talk about the analytic aspects, the types and sequence of testing. I'd like to start off with the broad groups of patients that one typically considers for testing, the asymptomatic patient or the symptomatic patient with venous thrombosis. Among the asymptomatic patients, you can divide them up into general screening, and right off the bat, I'll tell you, general screening is not indicated. So you don't do screening uh, in, in, in just somebody walking in your door that doesn't have any uh, thrombotic uh, problems. Maybe in the future, just like we do newborn screening for a variety of diseases, maybe in the future we will be doing newborn screening when cost of testing comes down, but we're not there yet. What about the group of patients who haven't yet developed a thrombus 
but maybe going to be, get exposed to an, an, uh, an acquired risk factor, for instance, hospitalization, surgery, pregnancy, orthopedic surgery, and orthopedic surgery is very high risk for thrombosis. Right now, there is no indication for thrombophilia testing in this group of patients in order to decide what sort of DVT prophylaxis you're going to provide. Every patient that's hospitalized requires an assessment for, for uh, contraindications of DVT prophylaxis, and at the very least, mechanical thromboprophylaxis is provided, and if there are no contraindications, pharmacologic thromboprophylaxis. Thrombophilia testing prior to oral contraceptive prescription and hormone replacement therapy prescription, a very, very common question that, that I get called about. And quite frequently it's, well, I did this thrombophilia testing on a patient now, she has the factor V Leiden, should I prescribe oral contraceptives or not? And, and it's, it's, the cat's out of the bag, you've already done the testing, but maybe you should take a step before, before you do the testing and, and decide whether it's worth doing the testing. I won't go into a lot of detail, but the type of analysis you need to do here is, is it cost effective to do this sort of testing? And there's good studies looking at pre-oral contraceptive uh, uh, pr prescription uh, and the role, the cost effectiveness of, of testing for factor V Leiden, and it has been found not to be cost effective. But if you look at the hormone replacement therapy group, that's a different story, and I'll illustrate one study. So this is a very well done study. It was a meta-analysis of uh, um, um, patients who uh, are exposed to oral hormone replacement therapy, and you can see the risk of um, venous thromboembolism is about threefold increased, but uh, patients with factor V Leiden have about a three to fourfold increase of uh, venous thrombosis. Now, if you have a patient with the factor V Leiden and you prescribe them a hormone replacement therapy, their relative risk of venous thrombosis increases quite significantly. Now, that's a relative risk, and I don't always know how to use that information when there's a patient sitting in front of me. So the authors of this study, and this is a very nice study, and this should be on your conference app. You can get that reference and read the details. So what the authors did was analyze what this relative risk meant uh, in absolute terms. So if you assume up to a 15-fold increased risk of venous thromboembolism, that's a relative risk, that translates into a, uh, an absolute risk of about 1% to 2% per woman year. Now, that is pretty common. So at least this analysis, which is from the United Kingdom, they did find it to be cost-effective for universal pre-HRT prescription screening for the factor V Leiden. And if a woman has a factor V Leiden, you maybe want to avoid the hormone replacement therapy. But I want to emphasize this is uh, based on data from the UK, and that may or may not be applicable to the United States or other countries. But this is the type of analysis that's really um, important for us to understand, is there value to testing? So um, coming to the group of patients that's symptomatic with thromboembolism, so right here, that, and that's the patient typically that you should ask yourself, do I need to do thrombophilia testing or not? Now, you know, a detailed discussion on, on the, on the um, role of thrombophilia testing is beyond the scope of, of the limited time that I have, but I'll provide you with broad brush strokes on what you should be thinking about. If you have a patient with arterial thrombosis, Really, our thrombophilia profile that we offer at Mayo is really designed to look at patients with venous thrombosis. So if you have a patient with arterial thrombosis, you really should be focusing on things like antiphospholipid antibodies and other uh, uh, acquired risk factors like smoking, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. So, so when I say arterial thrombosis, I'm referring to strokes, myocardial infarctions, and rarely peripheral arterial embolism. So that's the, that should be the focus. What about the patient who's just had say, orthopedic surgery, and develops a venous thrombosis. So that venous thrombosis occurred in association with a temporary risk factor. In this situation, testing is not generally indicated. And that is consistent with the uh, recent Ask Choosing Wisely campaign. Uh, there were five of them published in 2013. This has been updated. But one of them back then was, do not order thrombophilia testing for venous thrombosis occurring in association with a transient risk factor for venous thrombosis. Because for that individual patient, that risk factor, if it's truly transient, has, has disappeared or gone away or, or taken care of, and, and you would give that particular patient only a time-limited anticoagulation. So performing uh, you know, extensive lab tests is likely not indicated. So we have your arterial thrombosis, you have your venous thrombosis with a temporary risk factor, but what about the patient with an idiopathic event 
with or without a family history of thrombosis. So this is where I, I kind of put the, the maybe category. Maybe you should be testing some of these patients. Maybe not everybody, but certainly some patients. So let's take a step back and look at a, get a high-level view of anticoagulation for venous thrombosis. When you have a patient that experiences a venous thrombotic event here, there's initial therapy that consists of acute therapy that lasts typically about three months in duration. And knowing whether the patient has hereditary thrombophilia does not affect the acute management of anticoagulation. You're going to still treat the patient with whatever agent you're comfortable with, either heparin followed by warfarin, low molecular weight heparin, or one of the oral direct uh, uh, acting anticoagulants. Acute thrombophilia won't change your management. It's usually the duration of anticoagulation where you need to decide, okay, does this patient have significant risk factors that would warrant ongoing anticoagulation? Therefore, do you really need to do the thrombophilia testing? This is a very complex area. We see patients all the time that are referred to our COAG clinic uh, to uh, decide on how long they're going to treat the patient with anticoagulation. And there's the science of it where you're telling the patient that my management won't change, so I don't need to do testing. And then there's the art. The patient wants to know, do I have anything in my genes that will put me at risk for venous thrombosis? And that's a balance that I don't have a solution for, but we do a lot of tap dancing when we're, when we're seeing patients in that situation. Okay, so that covers, on a high level, an algorithmic approach on whom to test. If you do decide to test, the uh, Mayo Clinic uh, uh, Special Coag Lab, through Mayo Medical Lab, offers a thrombophilia approach to, uh, sorry, an algorithmic approach to thrombophilia testing. It starts off with some basic tests, which are all protein-based, by the way, except for the prothrombin gene mutation right here, for which there's really no protein-based testing. So these are all protein-based tests, and for the APC resistance, which is, uh, again, a protein-based test somewhere in here, right there, we do reflexive factor V lighting testing if indicated. Now, our thrombophilia profile includes testing for lupus anticoagulant, and Dr. Nichols has covered that, so I'm not going to go over that again. And I w instead, what I will focus on are the um, other assays. Again, to do a good job, you really have to focus on, on what I'm going to talk about, so I'm going to try not to, to uh, go overboard here. We'll talk about APC resistance, protein C. I'll spend some time on protein S. You can see for our protein C and antithrombin, we initially perform the activity assays. And if they're normal, we stop. But if they're abnormal, we go on to do the antigenic assay to classify. And ideally, if, the, if we had a good protein S assay, we would do the protein S activity assay as well. But, we, but the, and as I'll show, there are li severe limitations in the S activity assays. So we initially do a free antigen, and then we do a total to, to classify, and we may do an S activity depending on the situation. So let's focus a little bit on the factor V Leiden and APC resistance. So um, activated protein C resistance is the most common hereditary uh, thrombophilia among white population. And its um, genetic basis is the factor V Leiden mutation. So normally what happens is activated protein C cleaves factor V to inactivate it. But if you have APC resistance, in other words, if the factor V is mutated, it resists this inactivation and puts the patient at risk for uh, venous thromboembolism. The genetic basis, factor V Leiden. Since these, this disease was described in 1996, we, we uh, implemented the initial first generation of the APC resistance assay and decided that we would only do the genetic testing if this uh, APC resistance assay was abnormal. We just thought that was a more cost-effective approach. Protein-based tests are always cheaper than DNA-based tests. My interest in this grew a little deeper when in uh, to about 2010 we were um, evaluating a new lot of the APC resistance assay, uh, and I was just doing a post-implementation review. So I asked our, our IT folks to pull data between for 10 months of 2010 to pull all the APC resistance tests that had been done in our system. And, and I just wanted to look at the performance characteristics to make sure that it, it still met our, our reference range that we had established. And I said, oh, by the way, if there's any five lightens, get me that data as well. To my surprise, now, now these are data from our reference lab. So these are not Mayo patients, reference lab. Uh, 
To my surprise, four of, the four, of the 917 samples that they retrieved for me, or the data, 417 of the APC resistance also had the factor V Leiden ordered. And these were all normal APC resistance ratios. They all had the factor V Leiden when it really wasn't indicated. That surprised me a little because I thought we were offering this, at least for Mayo patients, we were offering the APC resistance with reflexive 5 Leiden, but it turned out, I realized, that we weren't offering this to reference lab clients. So, so I was reassuringly, all, factor, all 471 factor 5 Leiden results were negative. So that really made me happy that my assay was performing well. But, but we had to kind of fix this problem, so we are making the reflex available to Mayo Med Lab clients in the future. You can imagine as a practicing provider, you have the patient in front of you. It's, it's nice to have this sort of a reflexive testing because you can order the APC resistance first, and then if it's abnormal, you have to call the patient back. Oh, I need to do the DNA test. That's inconvenient for the patient, for the physician, for a variety of reasons. So having a reflexive approach really is the best way. We'll collect the sample and we'll only do it if it's necessary. So I'll just talk a little bit about the rationale for the APC resistance assay. It's an APTT-based assay, and so here's what happens. This algorithm has been shown in previous talks. I will not belabor it. So we obtain a baseline APTT on a patient, and let's say in this instance it's 30 seconds. And then we add in activated protein C, and as I mentioned, it'll inactivate factor V. So what's that going to do? It's going to prolong your APTT. So that's the APC APTT. And then we obtain a ratio. APC APTT over APC, baseline APTT, and lo and behold, here we have a, a, a normal APC resistance ratio. In our lab, 2.3 is the cutoff, so if it's 2.3 or below, that's an abnormally low ratio, and then we would do the 5 Leiden testing. So what happens in a patient who has APC resistance? Actually, let me take a step back. So this is an APTT-based assay, so you can imagine anything that affects that baseline APTT will render this ratio invalid. If your denominator is abnormal, then uh, does it make sense? So what are the things that will affect your APTT? Things like factor deficiencies, things like heparin, lupus anticoagulants, aid inhibitors. So in the first generation of the APC resistance assay, that, that was a real problem. So we were doing a lot of DNA-based tests because the ratio was indeterminate. But with the second generation of the APC resistance assays, what we're doing is mixing the patient's plasma in factor V deficient plasma. So what we're doing is replacing any deficient factor. It's got a heparin neutralizer in it, and it's in a one to five dilution, so hopefully you're diluting out the lupus anticoagulant. And so therefore, that, that really takes care of a lot of the, the uh, abnormal results. So in APC resistance, what happens is, again, you're obtaining your baseline APTT, and then you do your APC APTT, except this factor five now is mutated. So it resists inactivation. So although there's lengthening of this APC, APTT, it won't lengthen as a normal person would, and therefore your ratio becomes abnormal. So this is below 2.3, which is the cutoff in our lab, and it's important if you're running the APC resistance assay, you have to verify the reference range in your own laboratory before you implement it. So we've always done this. Uh, we've never published on the cost-effectiveness of this, but Dr. Uh, Taylor and all uh, published on the cost-effectiveness of this approach in their institution. So here's what they did. Over a period of a couple of years, they were sending out the Factor V Leiden and APC resistance assays. And they observed that physicians were ordering more of the DNA-based tests than the APC resistance tests. And that led to a total cost of um, about $60,000 a year. They projected that if this trend continued over the next six years, this would lead to a significant uh, expense of uh, close to $400,000 over the following six years. So they decided to intervene here. And what they did was a process of education, trying to educate physicians that you don't need the DNA test up front. And they also, what they also did was not only a process of education, but they negotiated with their reference lab to reduce the cost, and they brought the APC resistance in-house, so you can see the cost drop significantly. But the important point here is look at the number of APC resistance assays. The ratio is reversed. Far more APC resistance were performed than DNA-based tests, and that led to a significant cost saving. In essence, what they did was take control of the testing. And 
I, I shouldn't probably use the word control. I think they worked collaboratively with their clinicians, and that's what we do. We work collaboratively with our clinicians to educate them. As practicing physicians, it's impossible to know every detail about every assay in the laboratory. So it's a process of education working collaboratively. So by taking control, they were able to reduce costs. And I think these are good lessons to learn from, uh, from others' experiences. So um, I was curious to see what's happening on a national level. So for those that are not familiar with the Optum Labs database, this is a, a data warehouse where they have over 100 million covered entities. So this is a, a health insurer's database. And this Optum Lab database gives us access to uh, numbers for medical claims data for laboratory testing, both inpatient and outpatient. So for 2013, uh, we, we looked to see how are we performing and how is the, the general uh, pr practicing physician performing in the Optum Labs database. So we looked at the number of APC resistance assays and the number of five Leiden assays and, and obtained a ratio of APC resistance to five Leiden assays. In our institution in Mayo, this was the ratio. We had about 1,200 APC resistance, of which only about 270 required the five Leiden testing, and that was the ratio. One APC resistant to 0 0.25 Leiden testing. Not surprisingly, if you look at the data from the Optum Labs database, there were very few APC resistance assays, and physicians were ordering mainly DNA-based tests. So there were over 80,000 tests performed on 78,000 patients. Now, you know, point number one, this is a genetic test, a genetic disease, so you don't need to repeat the test to confirm it. So, so uh, I'm not sure of the reasons for that, but this was a completely different ratio. So I think out there, uh, if we don't control our own uh, ordering pattern, somebody will control it for us. So, so we're, we're hopefully we'll publish this and hopefully out in, in, the, in the general practicing population, ordering patterns will change. So uh, the next two slides, which I have added and will be updated, are looking at proficiency testing. Now, for those that don't know, all labs should participate and, and do participate in proficiency testing. So this particular sample was from the ECAT experience that we, we participate in, uh, looking at the uh, APC resistance assay. And, and this particular sample was from a patient with, who was heterozygous for factor V Leiden. And now there's only about 20 labs that participated in this because this was the assay without the factor V uh, deficient plasma mix. And you can see the ratios were quite spread out. And um, unfortunately, some of the labs actually used the ratio to interpret whether this was a 5 Leiden heterozygous or homozygous. Unless you really validate that and maintain that and, and verify that, it's really not possible just with the APC resistance assay to, to, to diagnose heterozygous or homozygous patients. So this next proficiency testing was using um, a kit that uh, you, where you premix the patient's plasma with five deficient plasma, and you can see the spread wasn't as narrow. That green arrow indicates what our result was. Um, and you can, the performance characteristics were better, but again, we were probably in this category because we don't, we don't diagnose heterozygous or homozygous just based on the APC resistance assay. I think you need the DNA-based test for that. You can see that some labs actually did do that and, and misdiagnosed as homozygous. So this was 178 labs using 10 different kits. So um, proficiency testing is very uh, important to, to uh, keep in, uh, to ascertain that your lab performance is uh, correct. This is looking at an annual review of molecular data from our laboratory, and, and you can see we have 22,000 5 Leiden assays, 21,000 per thrombin. But it's this MTHFR that I'd like you to focus on. Um, over 10,000 of one and about 3,000 of the other, 44%, 40% or so were heterozygous. I'm actually unsure why physicians ordered this test. Uh, I think there was some, some older literature where uh, it was felt to be you know, a big risk for venous thrombosis, pregnancy loss, but I think with more contemporary, better done studies, it's not so much felt to be a risk. What you need to do here is do the homocysteine level first. And if the homocysteine is normal, you really don't need the DNA test. So we're trying to develop profiles for this as well, because obviously clinicians are ordering it. We just need to help them order the right tests. So um, we talked about the APC resistance. Um, protein C uh, activity is what we first do to detect protein C deficiency, and we do the, the protein C antigen primarily to classify. Uh, it's a chromogenic assay we used, and this is the classification. 
So type 1s are, are decreased uh, activity and antigen. Type 2 is a dysfunctional protein, so the activity is disproportionately decreased compared to the antigen. But if you're ordering a protein C on its own, in, in, uh, you should be aware that there are a variety of acquired causes where you will find a protein C activity may be reduced. So don't jump to the conclusion if you have one pro low protein C on one test that the patient has uh, a, a congenital deficiency state. I'll spend some time on the uh, protein S uh, activity assay, uh, which I think is uh, something worth talking about. So for this algorithm, what we do is free antigen first, and then we do the total, and, and very few times do we do the S activity, and I'll explain why. Um, Dr. Marler published back in 2005, he was doing a reference range study with about five different kits, and he found even in normal donors, up to 10 to 15 percent of normal donors had a reduced factor phi of protein S activity. Uh, that was a bit of a surprise. Um, and he showed this in this uh, data set here, um, looking at their laboratory uh, established reference range using four different kits. Quite a few uh, of his normal donors had a, a pro quote unquote protein S deficiency. And yet, when he took some of these and then repeated the tests, they would go to normal. So there are so many biological variables that affect protein S activity assay. And if you use the package insert as a reference range, even a higher percentage of people had a quote-unquote protein S deficiency. So what, why is that? Uh, this is a very difficult assay, and the kits are very tough. It's, what you're doing in assessing protein S activity is measuring a cofactor activity, for which there are many, many biological and pre-analytical variables that influence your results. Some of them are listed here. If you, have an, if you have a lupus anticoagulant, you might, that artifactually elevates your protein S activity into the reference range. If you have a high factor eight or the Leiden mutation for selected kits, that will artifactually reduce your protein S activity. So just based on these uncertainties, rather than create an epidemic of protein S deficiency, we, we typically do the pro, free protein S antigen first before we do uh, the um, uh, activity. Now this, again, proficiency testing of a protein S deficiency sample uh, that we participated in, 155 labs, five different kits, and the assigned value for this particular sample was protein S activity of 34%. You can see the range of results that were obtained, 21 to 111, and, you can, and that uh, uh, graphically shows the wide variety of results that were obtained. So different kits, different labs, different manufacturers, you're gonna get different results. So, so hence uh, the difficulty with protein S um, diagnosis. So in conclusion, um, an algorithmic approach really begins with good patient selection and judicious ordering of thrombophilia testing I think is useful if it affects your patient management. So you have to ask that question to yourself. I'll share an anecdote. As I said, that's the science. How do you inject art into this? So I was sitting in the lab one day and I get this phone call from a patient. And he says, I had a pulmonary embolism and I want the factor V Leiden test. I'm like, oh, um, who's this? You know? He just called the lab out of the, co I don't know how he got to the lab. So it turns out there was a patient who had, who had just been dismissed from, the, from our medical center. He was treated for a pulmonary embolism and the thrombophilia testing had been ordered, but he was back in his home community. And when he got home, his friends and family were saying, did you have the five Leiden test? You have to have the five Leiden test. I'm like, oh, I kind of understood where he was coming from. And so I didn't know the patient, of course, and I said, well, why don't you just call you the doctor that treated you, and why don't you see if he can get you the results? I could see the results were pending, but I didn't know the patient at all, uh, and I didn't have the results. So that's where the patient expectation comes in, and that's where you really have to balance. It's fine for us to stand up here and say, here's the science, but there's an art in how to handle these patients as well. The bottom line is if it affects your management, it's reasonable to do testing. And if you do testing, I think it's reasonable to do a profile of tests. Um, you know, as Dr. Nichols showed you, false positive lupus anticoagulants can occur with direct thrombin inhibitors, um, and direct NA inhibitors. So when you do a profile, you're able to detect those, so we're able to interpret them. Uh, and, and at least we think it provides the most cost-effective approach.